Say, a leading think tank in Mexico, is hosting the Social Mobility Summit 2016. Some of the world's main experts will come together to discuss and help establish a broad agenda for research and policy making. Follow us via live streaming at socialmobilitysummit.org. Research and policy implications. Just before beginning, in other sessions, one of the first ones, we were told that mobility and social welfare are very different. Uh, so a question arises. Should mobility, for example, mobility in bicis, be a guide to social policy, to public policy in general? Uh, we saw a minute ago that quality of opportunity is very important and perhaps could be a link between welfare, mobility, and social policy decisions. Uh, I'm very glad to present uh, our, first, our, our first presenter, which is uh, Francisco Ferreira. Francisco Ferreira is a senior advisor in the World Bank Development Research Group, where he, where he oversees the bank research program on poverty, inequality, and agriculture. He has a very distinguished career in the bank, but I want to emphasize that he has been publishing widely on the fields of poverty, inequality, particularly on inequality of opportunity in developing countries. Please, Francisco, come and give your presentation. Muchas, muchas gracias, Rodolfo, y a los organizadores por la invitación. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. It's been a very nice conference so far. It is a bit daunting to try and speak about equality of opportunity after Francois's lecture, but let me, let me try anyway. Um, what I have to say will relate uh, quite a lot both to what Francois said and to Anders' uh, uh, presentation yesterday, which was, which was very, very nice. Um, I called it, uh, you know, like those, uh, those essay titles you give students, compare and contrast, equality of opportunity and intergenerational mobility. And my talk will be based on, uh, on two previous works. One is, is a chapter with Vito Peragine in this uh, Oxford Handbook of Wellbeing and Public Policy, which was published this year, and some earlier joint work with, uh, with Vito and with Paolo, Paolo Brunoari. So um, for this conference, I'm going to start very far away from mobility, and then I'm going to come closer and closer. So this is the hope. So I'm going to start with equality of opportunity, give you a very brief mention of the philosophical background, the canonical economic model, which I'll present somewhat differently from Francois, but you'll recognize the similarities. Uh, then issues of measurement of inequality of opportunity. And then from there, I'll come to measuring intergenerational mobility, which is a topic you all know much better than me, but I'll, I'll give you my little version and try and show some similarities and do a little bit of comparing and contrasting before moving to some empirical illustrations. So by way of motivation, which is hardly necessary here, I mean, I have some quotes here from, from FDR in 1937, from Alan Kruger more recently, in which they say things like, we know that equality of individual ability has never existed and never will, but we do insist equality of opportunity must be sought. And in 2012, I think around the time when Kruger uh, had this competition among his staff to name Miles's curve, and they came up with Great Gatsby curve, around that time, said uh, at, to the Center of American Progress, the rise in inequality in the United States over the last three decades has reached a point that inequality in incomes is causing an unhealthy division of opportunities. So people talk about inequality of opportunity in policy, and, and there's been, I guess, a, a, a debate and a literature in economics and in philosophy thinking about whether it, that concept is just a fuzzy thing or whether it can be defined and measured. So, so that's a little bit the motivation for thinking about uh, uh, equality of opportunity. And I think the pioneers of this field in economics, John Romer, Dirk van der Geer, uh, Mark Flerbe, uh, started from, and they started thinking about this, they started from uh, uh, this philosophical literature on equality of opportunity. And I mentioned a few of the key papers here, going back to, to John Rawls, and uh, drawing a, a parallel with Amartya Sen's uh, 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 work, which you know, James asked Francois about, so revisit that momentarily, briefly. And then Dworkin, Arnson, and Cohen. Now, what these guys are really doing, I mean, at the risk of, of, of summarizing a massive body of work in, in, in a very small and, and, and obviously too simple way, 
what they were doing was kind of moving the locus, the information basis for assessing social justice from outcomes, incomes or utilities, to something else. And in, in my view, what they have in common, these are very different perspectives, but what they have in common is moving a little bit from in ultimate choices to choice sets. In that sense, sense capability approach does belong here very much. It's the set of possible functionings that people want to choose from that are in capabilities, or in the work of Arnson and Dworkin, saying that, look, we ought to hold people responsible for the choices they make from within their choice sets, but not for the choice sets that they inherit, that are determined to them by their circumstances their gender, their race, where they were born, their family, the country they live in, whether there was a recession when they uh, uh, exited university, all sorts of things that are beyond their control. So it's moving the locus from individual choices that generate outcomes to the choice sets uh, uh, that's behind uh, this idea. And in fact, um, in this chapter with Vito, we kind of re reviewed the literature a little bit. There, there is, there is, a branch of the inequality of opportunity literature that tries to do exactly what James was asking in his question earlier, which is um, to do it in a set theoretic kind of way and establish you know, ways to value individual choice sets and then ways to measure the dispersion and the distribution of choice sets. People like Barbara and others have worked on that. Uh, and, and, and that's really looking, it's a direct approach of looking at inequality in sets. That's not the approach that has, in the end, kind of become more uh, uh, dominant, I guess, in the literature. And in particular, it is one that has spawned no empirical applications that we're aware of. And so, I'll be focusing on this indirect um, approach, uh, and I'll briefly mention the distinctions between ex ante and ex post in there, but you know, I won't have time to go into detail in that. But the thing about this indirect approach is that it bypasses the difficulties that I think Francois was alluding to when he was answering James's question about capability sets and so on. It avoids those difficulties of, of trying to measure things that are counterfactual, like you know, what other opportunities might you, you have had that you didn't take. This is kind of hard to do empirically. So this approach has bypassed that by focusing on the joint distribution of circumstances and outcomes. And, and here, you know, it draws on that distinction that people make between factors that are beyond individual control, which uh, Romer called circumstances, and many of us follow him in that, or factors that individuals have some control over, which he calls um, efforts, right? So the, the trick in the indirect approach to measuring inequality of opportunity is to look at the joint distribution between some outcome, Francois already said that the measure depends on the outcome you're looking at, so it's one thing for income, another for earnings, another for education, right? So you look at the joint distribution of that and a bunch of things that people don't control the circumstances and try to infer something about inequality um, from, from that. Notice that looking at that joint distribution is much, as, much the same as the informational basis of the mobility literature where you're looking at the joint distribution of parental income and child income, looking at those margins and at the copula in between them in various ways. Right? So now, uh, <coughs> Uh, the, the, this indirect approach to inequality of opportunity um, has two central principles, which are normative, right? It says the principle of compensation, and somebody in a question already referred to this, the principle of compensation is that outcome differences due to things that people can't control are unfair and should be compensated. And the principle of reward says, actually, there are some inequalities that are okay. Inequalities, outcome differences due to individual <coughs> responsibility, i.e. due to efforts, are ethically legitimate and need not uh, be compensated for or should be preserved. And there's a lot in the theoretical literature on this on when these two principles clash, when they don't. You know, they look like they're perfectly consistent, right? You just say, take the things people don't control, compensate them for that, the rest you don't. So actually, it turns out, depending on how you do it, um, these two principles are impossible to satisfy at the same time. Um, and, you know, in another talk or in another event, we could talk about that. We won't have time today. So based on that, oops, based on that, um, people have proposed a number of economic models of, social, of equality of opportunity and have used it in the literature to do two main kinds of things. One, to normatively prescribe allocation rules or social orderings. That is to say, if the government wants to maximize 
something to do with uh, uh, opportunity, then it ought to follow this rule or that rule and so on. And I won't talk about that today, though there's a big literature on it. The other was to draw on it to do something positive rather than normative, that is to assess the extent to which inequality in a society is due to opportunity, is due to differences in circumstances. So I'm going to present what Francois called the canonical model, although I'll do it in a slightly different way, which is somewhat more general, uh, uh, and which uh, Vito and I did in, in this chapter. And that is to say the key big starting point here is to assume that you can classify the variables, the characteristics associated with individuals in three groups. An outcome of interest, which Romer calls advantage, could be income, for example, you know, which is X here. And then everything else you can divide into two groups. You can divide into circumstances, things you can't control, and effort. And the outcome is some function of those two things, circumstances and effort. Um, let me to just show you the, 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 the workhorse matrix here, say that let's say that all elements of this vector C as well as effort is discrete. I don't need this, but just for what I'm going to use, we need, let's say that they are discrete. So xij is a function of the circumstance, circumstances that you have, the type that you're in, and your level of effort. Let's call type all the individuals that have a certain set of circumstances. So a type consists of individuals with identical circumstances. Whereas a trench consists of all individuals with identical effort levels. Let there be n types, m trenches. So then basically the point is you can represent society in a matrix like this, which is uh, you know, where you have the types on the rows. So these are people with identical circumstances. And then depending on the effort level that they have, they have different outcomes over there. And a trench is people who have the same or a similar level of effort. I don't need at this point to make what Francois uh, well, what is called Romer's charity assumption, to which Francois referred earlier, which is the idea that I'm going to call, uh, 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 I'm going to treat as effort relative effort measured by the, uh, the, the rank, the percentile of people in their, in their uh, distribution within a type. But I can have that. I don't need it, but I can have it. Associated with this problem, with this matrix X, there's a matrix P that gives the density function in each cell, and there you've represented society. So you see now how, in some sense, what the philosophers were trying to do, which was to expand the informational basis for the assessment of social justice has been done. We've moved from a vector of all these axes to a matrix of all these axes. That is to say, in order to formulate an assessment of inequality here, I need not only the vector of axes, but also how they divide across these types and trenches. Okay? So that's the kind of basis for this. Um, okay, uh, okay. Uh, almost every approach to measuring the quality of opportunity can be done with that matrix. But there are many different ways of using it. The direct unfairness approach and the uh, fairness gap approach that Francois mentioned are two ways uh, you, you know, you do something different to this matrix and, and you get to those. And, and there are other ways in which we've done, uh, we've done that. I want to mention very briefly a distinction that's somewhere sometimes in the literature between the ex ante and the ex post views of the principle of compensation, which are basically as follows. So ex ante follows largely Van de Gaar, 1993, and it says, what we want to do is eliminate inequality across types before I know anything about effort. So it's ex ante. Before effort realizes, I want to reduce inequality in the rows. So if I'm doing some maximin, for example, I want to take the least privileged type and improve its value. <coughs> and the value will have to be decided in some way. It could be the mean, or it could be an unfairness, a direct unfairness equivalent, it could be a fairness gap equivalent. So you could have many different ways of doing that. But basically, I want to reduce inequality between types before I know anything about F. That's the ex ante approach. The ex post approach, which is more associated with Romer, is to say, no, after effort is realized, I want to eliminate inequality amongst people exerting the same level of effort. That is to say, I want to reduce inequality within trenches. The two are not the same, although they may look the same, but they are not the same. Okay. All right, so how do people measure inequality of opportunity then? Well, all these different approaches do one thing, which is a, a two-step procedure. You should think of measuring inequality of opportunity in the following way. We replace the matrix xij, which is the total distribution of income, with a counterfactual x tilde ij, 
from which you've expurged all the fair inequality. You leave only the unfair inequality in there, and then you apply your measure of, of inequality, some measure, not the variance of logarithms, I agree with James, but some other measure, a meaningful measure, to that distribution x tilde ij. So clearly the key thing is, how do we eliminate fair inequality and leave only unfair inequality? Now, what Francois showed you earlier, and this, the things that Anders talked about briefly as well, are basically one version of this, uh, which is to replace each of those xij's with the type mean. So this is part of this ex ante approach in the sense that I'm eliminating all the inequality within types. You see that? There's no inequality within types. Remember that the ex ante approach wants to measure inequality of opportunity by measuring the inequality between types. That's been preserved here, okay? But the inequality within types has been taken away. Ingvild Almas and others have used direct unfairness and fairness gap to do this in a slightly different way. Um, uh, my co-author Vito Peragini and Daniela Kaki have one in which they do the ex post equivalent. They replace, they, they eliminate the inequality, or they leave only the inequality within the trenches in some way that, that respects it more. So there are different ways of doing that, and I, I won't have time to go into it here today. But the between types approach, which is the decomposition that Francois showed you earlier, is this. You take that matrix, replace each individual with their mean, and then you, uh, you uh, calculate inequality in it. Uh, and of course, uh, the, the way people have done this, this approach has generated a lot of uh, empirical applications. I'll show you in a moment some results for 51 countries from, from eight papers. Uh, but, you know, what they all do is they, they go, okay, we go to that matrix, which is what James and, uh, and his co-authors have called a smooth distribution. Uh, I've smoothed it by taking just the mean in the type and eliminating the other differences, right? And I apply some measure of inequality to it. That's the absolute <coughs> measure Francois talked about. Or I can see it in relation to the inequality in the original X matrix. So the X tilde over the X, that would be the inequality of opportunity ratio or the relative uh, measure. Again, as was already described, these uh, things can be computed either non-parametrically, which is just applying the, the tile index or whatever you want, the genie, whatever, to that matrix x tilde, right? Um, or it can be done parametrically. Parametrically, you must assume a functional form. And that is, of course, something you'd rather not do. So the only reason we sometimes do it parametrically is when the number of types n is so large relative to the sample that you have that within those uh, cells, right, within those cells of circumstances, within each type actually, within each row, you end up having so few people, you know, the females born from parents of this kind in that region and so on, they're so few that precision goes to hell and you can't do much with the non-parametric method anymore. So then we use the parametric method which is based, as has already been described by both Anders and Francois, on some simple OLS regression, which should be seen not as a causal model at all. So this is not the, the, the sort of holy grail that, that Anders was talking about, a causal structural model of inequality of opportunity, which would be wonderful. This is not that. This is a reduced form of Y on C and E, and E and C. So it's basically trying to get parametric estimates, right, of those conditional means. Remember, non-parametrically, we are taking the inequality in actual means for each type, right? And the regression just gives you, oops, the regression just gives you another estimate of that mean where I've imposed a functional form assumption. So this mu tilde here is just another mean, and I can calculate inequality of opportunity in that way. I mean, just, you know, take the, take the mean of inequality in each type. And if this model is true, the mean of inequality in each type is that, because the mean of epsilon is zero by construction. Okay? So that's all you're doing. It's a parametric approximation to the non-parametric calculation. In both cases, this is a lower bound. I had a conversation with Anders at breakfast and obviously failed to convince him that it really is a lower bound, but it is. Uh, it's, uh, I've proved it in a, in a, in a, in a, in a paper. In a, in a, and that's what it is. It's, of course, not a lower bound on any interpretation of, of psi. Psi can be biased in any direction. The R squared, this is a lower bound for. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, now, let me go on to the empirics a little bit. This is an illegible table, the point of which is merely to say that these papers uh, have all uh, calculated these things in slightly different ways. So Francois already made that point when he showed the comparison. Well, you know, this is some are parametric, some are non-parametric. Some use many more types than others. Uh, the circumstances are somewhat different, so really shouldn't be comparing these things, and yet I'm, of course, about to compare them. Uh, so here are some uh, results uh, from that. Um, uh, this is the 51 countries. The, the bars are total inequality. The, the residual, the blue is the level of inequality. And if you want to think of a broad range of numbers, the IORs here, which would be, you know, Anders yesterday talked about uh, those R squares, the, the, the square of the correlation coefficient in your intergenerational mobility e equations. This is what you should be comparing to IOR here. Uh, now, they are, in this case, not R squares, but they are, you know, as I said, the ratio of a mean log deviation to the total mean log deviation. So it's very much in the spirit of an R squared. Uh, and you know, they range from 3% in Norway to 40% in Malawi. Now, let me uh, uh, now come closer to the topic of this conference by saying a little bit about measuring intergenerational mobility and then making the comparison. So I think the key thing, obviously, to begin with, which is extremely well known to all of you, is that mobility can mean very different things <laughs> to different people. I like this taxonomy that uh, Gary Fields, based on his work with F.A. Oak and others, has proposed. You have measures of mobility as movement. Even that can be movement of what? Of, of the incomes themselves, of shares, of ranks. For incomes, you could have directional or non-directional movement. James talked a little bit about that yesterday. Mobility is time independence or origin independence. So there are all these different concepts. And, and in this literature that most people, I think, in this room are working on and are exponents of, they typically use uh, the origin independent measure. So that, that concept uh, over here, uh, you know, either through the correlation coefficient, so the mobility measure would be, say, the complement of the correlation coefficient, or the, the, the uh, 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 or, sorry, the, the, the correlation coefficient, of course, is related to the R squared, right? It's, it's the square root of the R squared. That's great, thanks. Uh, or you can use, actually, the regression coefficient. So all these IGEs, the intergenerational elasticity we've been looking at, are that beta in that, in that regression there, which is, of course, closely related to rho in the way that was described by the ratio of the two of the variances in the margins, right? So that's well known. So here's what I wanted to come to. So I started from a very different place, right? I started from kind of a philosophical argument, a normative distinction between inequality as cholesterol, as I like to call it. You know, some very bad inequality that's due to circumstances, and some not so bad inequality that's due to people's efforts. I started from that, but I ended up in a place, when I used the parametric approximation to this, which is very close, it's isomorphic to the literature on IGM. So in intergenerational mobility, you know, obviously there are sibling correlations and there are different things that people do, but one thing that people do, and that we've seen many times in this conference, is this regression here, just the Galton, the old Galtonian regression of son's income on father's income or daughter's income on mother's income or what have you. And then, you know, one measure you can take of that, you can take the beta, or if you want the margins to be treated equally, you can take rho, which of course is analogous to the R squared, it's the square root of the R squared. In this literature, we say, okay, I have a whole bunch of other circumstances here. It's not just parental income. I have parental income, but I have a lot of other stuff. And I'm interested in the explained share. I could use the variance if I wanted. That would be the R squared. <laughs> or I can use the tile or the mean log deviation or whatever. But whatever it is, it's a ratio of explained variance by circumstances to other things. And this is the sense and the intuition in which these measures are lower bound. Is that if I, if I have some omitted circumstance somewhere, and I put it in here, it can change the parameters psi on any other circumstances, whichever way. But it will either add nothing or it will add something to the R squared, as we remember from basic econometrics. And in the same way, it will either add something or not to the explained share of the partition. So that's the sense in which it's a lower bound. So let's think momentarily in the few, like four minutes I have left. Um, turns out inequality of opportunity, at least in the ex ante indirect approach that I've described, is actually very close, very isomorphic to the origin independent measures of intergenerational mobility that most people use. The difference is that we have more circumstances, right? Uh, and we deal with omitted variables in, in this way of, of, of treating IOP explicitly as a lower bound measure. I mean, the thing with, with here, right, 
is you're not going to treat this beta as a causal parameter either. And I don't think you guys do that in, this, in these interpretations, right? Because it can be correlated with all kinds of stuff. It's a measurement. It's a description of that association. Similarly, this is a measure, an, a description of an association, but because we have many things in there, right? We say, well, it's, it's an association between I and uh, Y and a whole bunch of Cs, a whole bunch of circumstances. And because I don't observe all of them, um, it has to be a sort of lower bound measure, right? That's the spirit. Uh, you haven't seen this before. Uh, the point of putting this here is to show you that, of course, we, we can do the same thing with the in, 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 in a quality of opportunity measure. So you know, I showed you the uninteresting graph here just to say these are now the points that I'm going to correlate with a few things just to show you Miles' graph using the IOR <laughs> rather, than, uh, rather than beta, rather than the IGE. So there's a whole bunch of countries. This is the level of inequality of opportunity. So I of x tilde. This is Gini coefficient, you know, the, the same positive association. You might say, but you know, this is kind of a part of that, right? So you want to do it with the relative. So you could do it with the relative, where this is the ratio of inequality of opportunity to total inequality. And this is the Gini. You still see the, the very strong association, very analogous to the, uh, to the uh, uh, mother. Okay, great. We'll, we'll make it. Uh, we could correlate the two things amongst themselves to see what that looks like. So I could have intergenerational elasticity of income. So this is the, the beta from, uh, I think, actually from a lot of papers by Miles and other people, uh, and the IOR. Notice that they're completely different data sets, right? completely different ways of constructing this thing. Uh, association of 0.6, is that just measurement error? Is that different uh, data that we looked at? Or is that different circumstances? These are interesting questions to think about. Uh, you could do it with Hertz's intergenerational correlation of education and the IOR. Again, you get you know, about 60% correlation there, highly significant, but not one. And so that leads me to conclude with my last two slides. I think this, these two, I, I very much appreciate the spirit of Anders' paper yesterday, that these two literatures don't talk to each other as much as they should, and I feel vaguely embarrassed because I think he and I both said the same thing about five or six years ago at a conference that Bash was also at in Chicago. Uh, and so we haven't, I guess, made as much progress as we'd, we'd like. And I, you know, I'm certainly one person amongst others to blame, blame for that. But I think we have to keep trying. Uh, the commonalities are that you know, both of these are, are frequently measured, typically measured, as sh the share in income variation at some point that's accounted for by people's family background. In the IGM case, mostly, you know, if, if you take a correlation coefficient or the R squared, that's what it is. It is parental income. In our case, it's for other circumstances. Neither approach, neither approach seeks to identify causal mechanisms. Both are correlation-based measurements. Both benefit from very rich data linking generations, and there's never enough of it. I mean, it was interesting to see David complaining about the uh, scarcity of these things in the US when to the rest of us. If you work on Brazil or on Africa, as I have done, you know, we just wish we had 50% or 10% of the data you have in the US, but you can never have enough. IGM takes a narrower view of family background, I guess, by focusing on income. Um, we take a broader view of circumstances, then have to struggle with convincing people that exactly what it is that we're estimating. Uh, yeah, um, all of that. So I'll end with this, which is a, which is a question um, uh, on which I'd love to hear people in this room who are you know the leaders in, in this field. Can anything be gained from combining approaches or comparing results? Or is it just a futile thing because you know, we're doing slightly different things and it just will continue in parallel? I'm not sure. These things, as I've shown you, uh, intergenerational mobility and inequality of opportunity are positively correlated, but the correlation is far from one. As I say, does that fact contain useful information about the extent to which non-income circumstances affect transmission of economic advantage in different countries? Or is it all due to different measurement errors, different data, and so on? Uh, and the challenge omitted circumstances and their potentially different correlation patterns of parental income and other circumstances mean that making this comparison within the same study may not be as easy uh, uh, as, as, as it might seem. But uh, I leave that as a question. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francisco. And our next pre uh, presenter is Anna Lutvinek. Uh, she's research manager in the Living Conditions and Quality of Life Unit of Eurofund. She's um, currently managing a very large scale 
Aerofund's work on intergenerational social mobility and equal opportunities. Please. Thank you, and um, good morning to everyone. Um, and first of all, thank you very much for um, an invitation to uh, share with you some of our um, ongoing work that we have started about two years ago, and we are about to uh, finish um, in a few months. So basically what I would like to share with you is uh, preliminary results of the patterns of social mobility um, in the EU countries, um, which are based on the quantitative information, uh, and I'll share with you the sources. But also, um, and I, I'm aware that um, uh, not many um, works that were presented yesterday and today, um, also some on information on the barriers and the policies that derived from the um, quality, uh, qualitative uh, methods. And um, not going very much into detail about the organization that I work for, but I think something that is very important um, to remember is that Eurofound, which is an EU agency financed exclusively by um, the European Commission, um, uh, is doing uh, only comparative work. Um, so we don't really, we don't have the resources nor the means to um, go very much into detail um, into specific countries, but what we do have um, means to is do comparative work. And we run three surveys, um, European Working Conditions, European Quality of Life, and European Company Survey to aid us to uh, monitor trends in social and employment um, sphere in Europe but also um, beyond uh, with the working conditions survey. But we also do a lot of stuff using um, other surveys and the social mobility work that we have carried out uh, is based on um, survey that is done by the European Commission. Uh, what I will do um, in my 20 minutes or so is um, tell you a little bit about the rationale and the objectives behind the project, um, what was the motivation and very importantly, uh, policy relevance um, for Eurofound to start working in this field that we haven't worked um, before. And then um, talking a little bit of our preliminary findings of the patterns, and then moving on to the barriers and the policies. Um, so this is, I think I've mentioned, so I'm not going to talk about that, but very briefly um, and importantly, uh, we have done a lot of work on job polarization, so monitoring, um, which I think is related very much with social mobility, so looking and mapping of what type of jobs are being created and are being lost um, due to the economic and technological progress. Um, and that led us to um, thinking internally that perhaps we uh, could do something uh, related to social mobility. But when we started to really reflect um, what is it that we could do that hasn't been done um, before, and hearing to you um, also making sure that we're not overlapping or we're not uh, duplicating, um, uh, we had to really make a very strong case to our board um, for the funding um, for this work to continue. Um, so very briefly, uh, Eurofound uh, focuses exclusively on intergenerational social mobility. And as a measurement, and I realized that um, I was fearing a little bit that I would be the only one talking about occupational mobility, so I was very happy to hear, to Patri to hear Patricia's presentation yesterday, who also used um, occupation as a measurement. And the reason, um, there were really twofold reasons why we decided to do uh, or to use occupational status as our measurement. First of all, we felt that um, of course, despite its um, limitations and shortcomings, um, it does give you a, I think, three important aspects of um, economic life, i.e. the income security, but also the short-term and long-term prospects um, of income. And secondly, uh, because we wanted to cover as many countries as possible, uh, we had to use the data, which is comparative um, throughout the EU countries. So we used the European Social Survey. I, I don't know if um, some of you are um, familiar with that survey, uh, but it's a survey which I think is fairly underutilized in terms of um, social mobility, but it has a very rich information um, in relation to the respondents' occupation and occupation, and occupation but also to the parents, um, both fathers and the mothers. Um, so because we set out to cover as many countries as possible, we felt that that was the best um, instrument for us to go with. 
Um, we also wanted to carry out our analysis for both um, fathers and mothers separately because we felt that um, many research, especially in occupational social mobility, has been traditionally done between fathers and sons, so we felt um, that could also be an added value of Eurofound. And in doing so, we were very privileged and lucky to, um, at the initial stages of our work, to benefit from the advice of uh, some of the people, top experts in occupational social mobility, having on board um, Goldfrop, Ericsson, Breen, um, uh, Gansebone to help us with the occupational classification. So we made sure that the parameters and the approach that we have um, uh, chosen was sound and robust. And we covered, we used um, the five waves of European Social Survey from 2002 to 2010. Um, covering for both for the absolute mobility 24 countries and for the relative mobility 20 countries. Um, and maybe just to uh, highlight that Eurofound is not strictly an academic organization, so everything that we do has to be very strongly located in the policy discourse and the policy dimension that is happening at the European level. So we had to really link very much uh, with um, the current policy developments and see whether the social mobility is visible um, at the EU level. And I think implicitly it has been there for a while, certainly with the European Europe 2020, which talks about inclusive growth and equal opportunities. But I think the social mobility has been given really a momentum uh, with the new commission, uh, which amongst the, its top priorities uh, place the issues of fairness and equal opportunities. And you had a, a lot of figures, um, important political figures in Europe, very explicitly talking about the fears and the concerns they have about the current generations not having the equal opportunities or chances that they had themselves in the past. And I think a very important development, um, certainly in the EU, uh, was the currently a consultation about the European pillar of social rights, which will be a document which will underpin everything that will happen for the next foreseeable future in the area of social policy and social protection. And the Commission um, has been, I think, rightly um, criticized for some time following the crisis, paying a lot of attention to economic and fiscal policies and maybe neglecting a little bit of social policies. So this is an attempt to address that. And then, um, I think very explicitly you had the Juncker, which is the current president of the European Commission, making a State of the Union speech um, this September, mentioning explicitly social mobility and the challenges um, to social mobility. And of course, importantly, these, all these documents that pop up at the European level, they don't operate in a vacuum, but they also are a very true reflection of what's happening at the member state level. So I think we can really see a momentum of um, social mobility being a, a topic discussed even though um, policymakers very often do not understand or don't know it or have a very different understanding what uh, social mobility. And I think the good thing is that even though the EU may have very little competence um, in some of the um, policies um, in relation to social mobility, Nevertheless, I think this framework will translate into the national discourse and the national policies that we will see over the next um, few years. So now I'll show you um, just the first preliminary graphs and the results of the patterns of um, social mobility. So this is absolute mobility for 24 countries. And this shows the um, patterns for men um, in comparison with dominant or the highest class in, um, in the household. We have also distinguished between upward and downward, but also horizontal mobility, um, following very much Richard Breen here, and also indicated the levels of immobility in the member states. Um, and then we're doing the same analysis for women. And in talking to experts or trying to validate the results, um, we have also heard that perhaps this um, hides a little bit um, the superficially high levels of upward mobility and um, there were suggestions that we should do the same analysis uh, based on cohorts um, with the expectations that the la latest cohorts may exhibit um, much higher levels of downward mobility. So this is something that we are 
um, in the process of doing uh, and validating with previous results that have been done in this area. Even though um, I must say that the countries that we are particularly interested in, the Central and Eastern European countries, also Baltic countries, and some of the southern countries have not been covered in the comparative research on occupational social mobility. So we are now traveling to those countries for some country missions of trying to understand of what lies behind uh, these results and whether, according to the experts in those countries, they stand. Um, after carrying out this exercise on absolute mobility, which of course takes into account the structural changes that have happened over the years in Europe, um, we then move to the um, patterns and the results of the um, relative mobility, um, some people calling it gold for, for example, how fluid or open the societies are. And first of all, we wanted to see whether we can observe a convergence um, uh, of social of social fluidity amongst countries. And here, um, this graph covers 20 countries. We can see that um, I think up to the generation of um, born before 1946, up to the generation of baby boomers, there was certainly a convergence. And the lines, um, if they go down, that means a higher social mobility. But after that moment, I think the picture is um, very mixed. And also, we are trying to understand a little bit what lies behind it. And then after that, we have um, identified four clusters of countries. On the left-hand side, you have the, the good performance. So we have the countries that have had high levels of um, social fluidity and social mobility and continue to do so. And here we have um, Belgium, we have Denmark, we have Finland, we have Netherlands, which um, seems to be, in our results, a very social fluid and mobile country, and Slovakia, for example. And then on the left-hand side, you have a group of countries where um, social mobility was um, increasing up to the, the second cohort you have there. Um, and then afterwards, um, due to many factors probably, it has been either stagnating or decreasing. And here we have Austria, we have Bulgaria, we have France, we have Sweden notably, and also to a lesser extent Germany, um, Spain, and Hungary. And um, again, we're trying to, there is also two, a smaller cluster of um, countries. We have Estonia and Slovenia, where we observe a continuously downward um, or decrease in social mobility, and then Ireland and Portugal, where the um, social fluidity has been increasing. And again, as I said, um, this is rather descriptive mapping. So we are, what we are trying to do now is go a little bit deeper and understand the determinants and the factors um, that lies behind these patterns. One advice that we have received again um, is to repli replicate that analysis for, um, based on gender. This is based on the whole population. So at the moment, we're doing the analysis for um, female and men. And I must say, I was obviously, I didn't get a brief to um, include um, Miles' um, great Gatsby uh, graph in my presentation. Um, but I looked a little bit at, at, he, at, at Miles' results. And for the countries that are overlapping, you can see <coughs> a very certain similarities of countries which are open and, and more closed. So that was really the patterns. Um, and the second part of the exercise um, we are doing is looking a little bit about at the drivers um, uh, that are very visible in the policy discourse. Um, what are the, the, the drivers? What are the main concerns among the stakeholders and the policy makers um, in the member states? And we used a survey amongst our network of correspondents, which are located in the uh, 28 member states, and we try to um, see if we have, if we see any commonalities or common drivers that are behind the the, the current concerns. And first of all, I think um, something which I think we are, it's not a surprise, um, the fact that the term social mobility is very rarely mentioned, um, and it's not really on the agenda, apart I think from several countries, UK, of course, by far uh, a country which um, is very sensitive, but also Greece. Um, uh, we were a bit surprised how high on the agenda social mobility is there. 
the concern about the fairness, um, which manifests itself in fairly different ways in between countries. We have the um, concerns about the security of pensions, um, for example, in Italy, and then a very wide concerns in many, many countries about the future of youth, um, but that I think is exaggerated and very, very high on the agenda in the southern countries, but also in some of the uh, Baltic and southern European countries. The squeezed middle classes and the diminishing role um, of middle class um, and the growing number of losers, of people that have le been left with the feeling of being losing out, and the possible impact of different types of engagement uh, that has been prevailing in many, many countries, including Hungary, Slovenia, but also Netherlands, Latvia, or Malta. Um, the concerns over what we uh, call in Europe the social cohesion or the regional dimension of um, uh, social mobility, something which we didn't really pay too much attention at the beginning and we didn't really realize how huge it is, even in very, very small countries in Europe, um, but it seems to be a major concern among the Baltic countries, but also some of the Nordic countries, um, France, um, notably one of the countries which uh, that has been picked up as a, as a big issue. And finally, um, in terms of the drivers or some of the, the topics that have been popping up in the, 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 in the policy discourse was the diminishing role of education and the fact that the ju education doesn't guarantee you a, high, a, a good job anymore um, and the value of qualification, sort of commodification and the, the fact that parents trying to, um, despite policy efforts to make the um, maybe education more equal, trying to hard, trying to um, quite hard to maintain the advantage in the education system. Um, now the second area we looked at was barriers and of course when we talk about the policies um, you need to understand a little bit or we wanted to understand a little bit what are the main challenges and barriers uh, that exist in the different countries um, to social mobility, and we focus very much on system barriers, um, something where Eurofound and we do have expertise. So we looked at the childcare, um, education, and the labor market. And using them in the report, um, we then report based on the country clusters what type of types of barriers are most prevalent in different countries. And in the childcare um, area, those relate to issues of accessibility and costs. Um, in the education, the very strong um, notion of tracking and ability grouping, and in a labor market, um, yes, the access to occupation, but also um, the issue of transition. So current generation, I think, being constantly lost in transitions. I think you don't have a very typical pattern that maybe the parents or grandparents had of moving very steadily um, on course to adulthood. I think the transitions are very much protracted um, in many economic ways, but also in terms of transitions of living independently, um, you know, owning a house, uh, something that Joe um, talked about yesterday, um, which I think is very important. So I think uh, this instability um, has an impact. And finally, um, just a very uh, quick scan, because that's something, I'm not sure we can see that very well. Um, just we looked at uh, the mapping and some policy analysis of the current policies and programs um, in, in each of those three areas. So, and then looking what is it that is happening in the different countries in those areas. So in childcare, we see that there is certainly policies to improve access to childcare, which manifest itself of the right to be enrolled. There are many countries which um, the childcare still does not exist in Europe. Certainly, this is happening in Portugal or um, free services um, in Malta. Um, another trend which uh, we observe in quite a few countries is mandatory um, preschooling um, emerging as, um, as a policy in many countries. And here, interestingly, um, there seems to be quite a lot, or not maybe quite a lot, but um, a resistance among certain countries which do not believe that the mandatory childcare is, a, is an option for them to go. Um, in the education field, um, what we observe, and I don't know if it's a impact of how well Germany has um, weathered the crisis, um, but certainly there's more and more countries that are looking towards the VET, vet system, the vet, um, vocational training, um, 
and that is uh, being seen even in the countries which uh, traditionally have not had that, um, for example, Sweden. Um, uh, but what is related with, um, with the vocational training is countries realizing that um, much more attention needs to be paid to the quality um, and the recognition of vocational training as a viable and equally prestigious track um, to the more academic one. And I think a good example here is UK, where the, the government is trying to push with the vocational training, but you have certain expectations amongst the society, but definitely amongst the company and business, that this is really something which is um, not as prestigious and as desirable in terms of education um, outcomes. Uh, there is a, a very strong movement to pay more attention to tracking or ability grouping and trying to reform that a little bit. But what is coming uh, out from our research, which I find very interesting, is that two countries which seem to be extremely fluid and extremely open are Netherlands and Belgium. And in both of those countries, you have tracking and ability grouping quite firmly established in those member states. So what we're trying to do now is understand a little bit what are the features of the tracking which doesn't um, pose, doesn't, um, pr um, doesn't pose to be a, um, a barrier to social mobility. The quality of teaching um, comes as a strong um, uh, feature and I think there was a couple of papers uh, for example, linking the quality of teachers um, in Sweden um, to a lowering level of social mobility. And I think Sweden has responded quite well in paying more attention to um, a, a higher standards amongst teachers. And then the second area, which I think within education we see as um, uh, growing there, is paying a little uh, more attention to parenting skills, or for example, paying more attention to the beyond school environment um, and, and trying to look at it in more holistic way. And finally, um, in the labor market, I talked about transitions um, and there's a lot of effort in trying to make the transitions a bit smoother, access to occupations. And I think Michelle uh, in her presentation talked about yesterday uh, about maybe poorer or more disadvantaged kids not opting for good colleges. And I think there's certainly the case for um, a more disadvantaged but bright um, adolescents not applying for good jobs and I think self-selecting themselves out already at that stage and not trying to join prestigious or elite um, occupations. Um, and finally, uh, some reflections that we have now uh, trying to, oops, uh, trying to um, wrap up our report and, and trying to single out a couple of um, key messages that we would like to leave our policymakers with. Um, so we see that the social background continues to matter, um, even in the most socially fluid societies in Europe. Um, there has been improvement of fluidity after a certain point, certain convergence of countries, but that has changed and we have a much more mixed picture. The growing regional dimension um, and the place of living affecting your life chances. And I think there certainly hasn't been uh, enough attention at the pol political and policy level and trying to think of some measures to, to deal with that. And importance of middle classes and some experts um, uh, pointing out that perhaps uh, more should be done to look at, it, look at the impact of um, the cuts, uh, severe cuts in some member states to uh, public services in, in which many of the uh, middle classes would work and how uh, those cuts impacted on the, the levels um, of living standards amongst the middle classes. And finally, this is my last slide, uh, trying to also, we are left with some questions um, that were popping out or keep popping up in each of the discussions that we have in the different countries with the experts. Um, Certainly when we talk about occupational social mobility, um, there was a question, there is a question, is there a saturation point uh, for upward mobility? You know, have certain countries reached that point that they cannot go any higher? And linked to that, the fact that the higher education no, doesn't guarantee a good job anymore, so you have this crowding and pushing up, pushing up at the top. But what you do, do have, um, it's something that is happening apparently in the Netherlands, 
you have this bottom group uh, which finds it extremely difficult. They feel stuck and they cannot move up. <laughs> the transitions, um, and I think uh, the long term effects on the fabric and maintaining trusts in the society. And finally, uh, which I think many of the speakers have referred to, the difficulties of measurement. And I think here, the two, there are two points. Uh, there was a lot of concerns whether the occupational class uh, and occupational structure is relevant to all countries in Europe, um, in particular to countries in Central Eastern Europe or Baltic countries, which had this very transition um, uh, period and whether that would be relevant. Um, is there a better measurement? And finally, I think also importantly, the impact and the effect of the fundamental changes in the labor market um, that are happening and how that would affect um, further research on social mobility. We see um, a huge and enormous growth of the new forms of employment, um, a, a growth of temporary contracts, people moving from employment to training to internships, so you do not have a very um, predictable path and how would that have an impact on I imagine um, all the different types of measurement in social mobility. And finally, um, uh, just to tell you, um, for us, we are now trying to put it all together. And also we are quite limited in the sense that we have to come with a fairly short um, policy oriented paper um, that will be published next year. Um, so we are now also looking, through, looking for um, an indication what is it um, that the there are many different um, findings that we have ha had found, so we need to be now very selective in what is it that we put in the final report and um, come up with a strong messages um, to the policymakers. Thank you. Our last presenter is Juan Rai. He's a medical doctor. Uh, he works as head of uh, EU cooperation in Mexico with special emphasis on analyzing uh, and policy the dialogue on social cohesion. He has focused his research on global health and equity. In the uh, last years, he has written a book on that subject. Please. Uh, good morning. I still think we are in morning. I'm very grateful to El uh, Centro de Estudios, Espinosa Iglesias. Thank you, Enrique. Rodolfo, all the team for inviting me. I am probably a strange animal in this uh, room uh, because uh, from what I heard uh, today and what I uh, heard of yesterday, I had a colleague coming and this has a very high um, academic level, uh, scientific level. And um, I'm, uh, I'm more in the cooperation side as a civil servant trying to implement our programs. But also from my health experience, um, I went into health equity metrics. And I thought that some of uh, the research I've done on, on health equity could be interesting to, the, to, the, to some of the dimensions of social mobility. Um, I won't go, in fact, into EU policies on social mobility. I, I work in external action. And we don't have a, a policy on inequality. There's now a working paper. I'm part of a working group, and we're reflecting on that. So uh, with that, uh, let's say, freedom of uh, lack of framework, I, I, I wanted to share a few ideas with you uh, that uh, at least uh, meaning no EU position on my personal analysis of uh, 30 years of external cooperation um, I think are very relevant and I hope they will be very provocative to, to, to you and to, and to the session. I still hope we have some minutes of, um, of discussion. And I brought a book I will give as a gift to the best question. So <coughs> the, um, I, before I go on uh, with that, um, I wanted to know um, how many of you are economists? Can you raise your hand? Wow. <laughs> Uh, so how many of you are sociologists, uh, work on social sciences, yes, and uh, any other uh, type of um, participant? Lawyers. One or two. Lawyers, okay. Journalists. Lawyers are clustered on the back, interesting. Uh, statisticians, probably. But I, I gathered from my quick uh, statistical eye that some uh, 70 to 80% of you are economists. 
So I, I'm happy because I will, uh, I will be more provocative even because I, I will uh, challenge uh, some of the economic, I think, mainstream ideas which I think are a problem to, our, to equity in the world today. Uh, the way I, I titled my presentation, uh, and in fact, uh, when I came, I found out that uh, my presentation was blank, the one I gave in my USB, so I quickly <laughs> prepared some notes and copied some graphs. Uh, but I wanted to talk to you about the ethical margins um, and purpose of social mobility. It looks like social mobility is good in itself, but I want to, I want to um, reflect on that. Um, I'll start with uh, Plato. Plato in 360 before Christ, he said that the form of law which I should propose uh, would be as follows. In a state uh, desirous of being saved from the greatest of all plagues, here should exist among the citizens neither extreme poverty nor, again, excess of wealth. For both are productive of both these evils. Now the legislator should determine what is to be the limit of poverty or wealth. And I think this is one of our main uh, dilemmas. Um, in mainstream economics or in the dominating West, we tend to accept uh, economic growth uh, with no limits um, and wealth as signs of success without uh, much criticism. And I want to talk about those uh, limitations which are, I think, important to social cohesion and mobility. Um, the other thing that I would, uh, sorry, this is in Spanish. <coughs> I'll go back this time. The other reference which I wanted to make is what is happening, what, what is happening this week in, in, in Morocco, in Marrakesh, and how we are um, in, uh, in terms of um, exhausting nature and uh, not just climate change, we will have uh, another conference of parties later on uh, next month in Cancun on biodiversity, how we're exhausting nature in different ways and uh, surpassing uh, planetary boundaries is also affecting what you've been talking on intergenerational um, uh, mobility. Uh, but also um, it is a, um, a question on how economic growth, particularly when it exhausts nature beyond sustainability levels, um, how can that be acceptable um, without question. Now, sorry this is in Spanish, but I was coordinating the health uh, team in uh, what we call DG Development, which is uh, our policy making uh, director general or ministry if you want in the, in the EU for the external action. And after, I'm a medical doctor, I worked in the 80s and 90s in frontline rural Africa, and, I, and uh, being from Europe, I could experience in my own practice the huge differences, the unfair, very clear, unfair differences, unfair inequalities, therefore inequities in health in the world. And uh, when I coordinated what we called the EU policy on global health, and that was adopted in 2010, I then took some time off um, in, uh, and went to UC Berkeley where I'm a professor in health uh, equity metrics and tried to understand uh, what do we all mean by global health and what we as different nations or regions, what are our, what are our aspirations in terms of health in its wide sense, health and well-being of, of people. There is no common definition of global health, there is no common commitment across, across countries on global health. There are very different approaches to, for instance, health as a human rights and human rights commitments overall. And uh, the only common um, global health objective with some kind of international uh, legal binding is the commitment to the constitutional objective of the World Health Organization, which basically says all countries will strive for the best feasible levels of health for all people. Now it's interesting that we only have that objective and it dates back from 1945, before even the, the Charter of Human Rights, but we've never measured it. So anything that has to do with um, um, <coughs> best health or pursuit of happiness and so on is left to the, uh, let's say, uh, romantic literature and it's not measured because we think it can't be measured, so everything uh, remains unaccountable for. 
But I tried to measure that when I, when I started this combination of my policy work in the EU and my academic activity on global health equity metrics. And uh, in, why we have never measured how we've progressed on this very only uh, global health objective, best feasible health for all people. Firstly, because we never measured what is the best feasible like health. Uh, and second, well, we couldn't see how did all countries and, uh, progress towards that best feasible level of health. Now, and there's yet another thing, I think in, the, in, in this century we need to add to any policy uh, reflection, which is how not only feasible, but how sustainable <coughs> is our level of health and well-being for coming generations. So I tried to do that, and this, and I basically, I, I missed one slide here with the, with the, with the problem. What I, what I did was, uh, in a very simplistic way, and uh, I'll be very, I'll be very understanding if you criticize me for being very simplistic, but here it goes. Um, I looked at countries that from 1950 till, nine, till 2013, we had international comparable data. Uh, of course, we can argue how precise and, um, uh, and uh, reliable were those data. But based on those international statistics, I looked at countries that had a good health and they had economically feasible models and ecologically sustainable models. And I used three criteria, one, uh, which were available and with their limitations, they allow some comparison between countries. One is which countries had life expectancy above world average during all these uh, 70 years. But which of those countries had that good life expectancy but having a GDP per capita, and here, become, here comes the first anathema to, to economists, had GDP per capita below world average. Why? Well, um, we've always been following models of high income, uh, high income countries. The, the, the OECD Development Aid Committee is basically based, uh, uh, formed by rich countries. And we follow those development patterns of countries we, who are, uh, in, which are enjoying very high levels of income compared to the rest. Now, the economic resources are limited, and those, uh, those uh, levels of income uh, are not replicable for all countries. So we would need three, four, five planets to have the, uh, the level of uh, income of high-income countries uh, replicable for all countries. So I look at feasibility from the economic angle. Of course, there's a there's a lot of work behind on why we used economic and GDP per capita and uh, PPP or other means as a, as a factor of replicability or feasibility. But uh, just bear with me for that simplification. We looked at countries with good health, life expectancy above world average, feasibility, economically replicable models, GDP per capita below world average, and third, a carbon footprint in terms of carbon emissions, the most urgent of our planetary boundaries below uh, the planetary boundary. So, oh, oh. now we have a problem, well, Houston, who's helping me now? I hope this can be fixed, but in 60 plus years, we could only find 14 countries that constantly had met the three criteria. They have health, uh, life expectancy constantly above world average, but GDP per capita below. And the carbon emissions, particularly for the last decade where we have very clear analysis of planetary boundaries, they were ecologically sustainable. Here it goes. So these are the different countries you will see here. The countries uh, with life expectancy below world average, these, these were countries uh, with life expectancy above world average, but uh, had GDP uh, um, uh, again uh, above world average, so they could not be economically replicable models. These were countries that uh, having GDP below world average and a good life expectancy, uh, they had uh, carbon emissions above the planetary boundary. They could not <coughs> be sustainable models. And, only, and these were the countries that met the three criteria, but only the top ones met those criteria constantly. Why I tell you? Because what uh, we did very quickly, I'll say, 
because I want to go into uh, mobility. Um, we, for the first time, uh, think we measure the burden of health inequity, which means uh, we, we had some standards of, uh, of good health, and we had them disaggregated by age groups, by sex, and by uh, annual average in each five-year period from 1950 till now, millions of data. And uh, we calculated what was the excess mortality in each country, in each age group and sex during all that, during all those periods, in comparison to those minimum standards of those countries that had healthy, replicable, and sustainable uh, uh, models. And it was uh, impressive because you will see that the, this is the number of excess uh, mortality, excess avoidable deaths, one could say, in comparison to those healthy, sustainable, and feasible models. They went down in the 60s, but from the 60s, 70s, the number of avoidable deaths, around 17 million in the world every year, has remained quite constant. Now, this is more uh, precise because what we did to compare between uh, periods and between countries, we looked at the proportion of all deaths in each age groups, which meant excess mortality from those feasible and sustainable standards. And it is very, uh, this is a very quick uh, um, summary, but these are the proportion of in, in each age group. And they remained around 40%, the bar, uh, the red bar here is the total, uh, the average of all age groups, they remain around 40% from the 1970s. And this was the distribution in the world of that, what we call relative burden of health inequity, proportion of deaths which are in excess of feasible and sustainable standards. And, uh, and uh, we, could, we have interactive maps and graphs for every country and age group and so on. But I won't go into, into, into that uh, detail of analysis what we did after was uh, look to look at each uh, at different regions and different countries. This is what we see, for instance, in Europe. Uh, the, in Europe, we have these regions. These regions have GDP per capita below the EU average uh, GDP per capita, EU weighted GDP per capita, and they have life expectancy above the European um, average. And of course, there's not one region, and these are what we call the not two regions, I'm sure Anna knows them well, uh, not one region in, in Europe that has carbon emissions below the planetary boundary, below some 2.2 or so uh, metric tons per year. But they have commitments <laughs> from Paris, and we hope that that is in the making. In any case, uh, from, uh, from these models, we can, again, estimate at regional level what is the burden of health inequity, the excess mortality, even measured in avoidable deaths if you want because of unfair inequalities, inequities. And this is something easy to understand by people and by politicians. Human, or let's say social injustice or unfair inequalities have a price in lives. And, uh, and it, is, uh, it is really striking to see that uh, this is the burden of health inequity by different patterns, but in some areas, for instance, of southeastern Europe, uh, but also scattered in many other regions, there is a very high burden of health inequity. You're surprised to see uh, regions in southern Germany or in, or in the Midlands in Sweden or in southwest uh, um, uh, UK, others with, with loss of life above what is feasible and sustainable, for instance, at the EU level. Now, how to combine this global analysis and this regional analysis like the one in Europe is interesting because um, the GDP per capita on purchasing power um, units, purchasing power part, <laughs> um, was similar to something I'll explain now, with, similar to an upper threshold, and that's what I want to get to, of the distribution of resources in the world, which would allow everyone to live at least above what I will say now, a dignity threshold. So it's interesting this. The more we go into <coughs> sub-national and sub-regional analysis of healthy or well-being and feasible and sustainable models, the more specific we can be, the more sensitive 
And then more specific, if we apply those standards to, to, to more disaggregated units in measuring the burden of health in empty. Now, this, this, is, this is, for instance, what I, what I did was for the US, for Mexico, and for the EU. I compared, we compared what was the excess mortality referred to first. That, those first standards, which I, which I told you, national average of countries which were healthy, feasible, and sustainable. But then I also compared to the national, at, at subnational level, for instance, uh, among the 3,500 plus counties in the US, which of them have, again, life expectancy above the national average with GDP below, and none of them, uh, I'm afraid, uh, sustainable for the moment. The same for Europe and so on. The best sub-regional, uh, uh, let's say, units we have in the world analyzed so far in terms of uh, healthy, sustainable, and replicable models are those in, in, uh, in, uh, in the Mediterranean, in, 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 in the EU, in south, uh, southwest uh, EU. So uh, of course, by doing that, we have very different levels of sensitivity of the burden of health inequity. And you can see here that, for instance, in the US, and I'll uh, give a lecture in Boston on, 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 on far more disaggregated analysis on US burden of health inequity in a, in a week time, but almost 400,000 deaths a year are in excess of, for instance, the standards of the, of, uh, the EU feasible, healthy, and sustainable models, which have, by the way, a GDP per capita some three times lower than the average US GDP per capita. In one sentence, there is a very high cost of lives in the US due to unfair inequality. And this is what happens in Mexico. I want, in Mexico, we are now publishing a specific book on the burden of health inequity in Mexico and the distribution by regions and so on. Um, so this is, this is what, I, uh, what I wanted to present you after that analysis as a provocative idea for discussion. In a fair society, as Plateau said uh, three, uh, some uh, 2,300 years ago, we need to identify levels of dignity. Measuring poverty, I mean, out of the, those 17 million people, seven, uh, 17 million, sorry, excess uh, mortality due to unfair inequality, inequalities, 10 million live out of poverty. 10 million live out of the $2 per day of the sustainable, of, of sustainable, do, uh, gold, uh, sustainable Development Goal 1. Um, so poverty is not enough to ensure a dignified life, a life at least in access to a quantity of life expectancy which could be feasible for all people. So we call this dignity threshold, and it's much higher. It's like eight times higher the poverty threshold of uh, SDGs. This is the average PPP in the world. Now, if you have a minimum and you have an average, and this is the, the question, shouldn't we think of a maximum, of an excess threshold? And this is what Plato suggested 2,300 years ago. And it looks like in the West, we've been blessing the excess, the success measured in excess accumulation. But there's a limit to that, right? And the three limits of of having excess accumulation are one, and this is, uh, I'll, say, I'll say this very quickly because I believe I only have four minutes left. Uh, one is that if there is an indirect relation of, of accumulating excess wealth with those many, which is uh, around 40% of the world's population, living under this dignity threshold, below which no country in 70 years has been able to have a national average life expectancy which could be feasible for all people. You see my argument. So there is an indirect relation of excess accumulation and loss of life of those that live under the minimum dignity. The second, the second argument is that there is a correlation between that excess accumulation, having GDPs much higher than that, and exhausting nature. There is a very, very strong correlation and I was reading today that um, the subsidies to the oil-related economy are over 300 trillion a year. And this is three times ODA, and it's more than twice the subsidies to renewable energies. We live in an economy so far where there's a very high correlation 
with excess accumulation, excess <coughs> production and consumption, and exhaustion of nature. But the third and most striking, striking um, um, question to excess accumulation is that beyond this uh, excess threshold, life expectancy, but many other indicators of well-being do not improve. I don't know if you're familiar with the book of um, Wilkinson and Pickett on the spirit level. They analyzed over 50 well-being indicators, and they said, beyond a certain level, we just accumulate, but not for even our own good. And we see that in the EU. In the EU, the healthy life expectancy in the last five years has not increased. In fact, on average, has, has slightly decreased, despite GDP, and this is even beyond uh, b before the crisis, despite increased GDP per capita and increased uh, health spending. Now, um, so that would be, this is something to consider. A fair society would, like Plato said, would probably need to limit a minimum income, a maximum, uh, around an average. And now I'll go very quickly to the last slide. It's interesting that in that global distribution of resources, that equity curve could well accommodate GDP per capita levels here of the ones of regions like Southwest Europe which have the highest life expectancies in the world with Japan and others. So we could have very good life, but limiting the excess and ensuring the minimum. So, my, and this is, this is uh, uh, 10 seconds for this one, please, because it took me a month. And it's, it's around these equity curves of population and people, people in blue, population in, in yellow. This is a, a theoretical equity curve under which there would be enough resources for everyone, and everyone would live, would be on average, in his or her country, having a life expectancy would be feasible and, 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 and sustainable for all. Now, this is, this is what it would be, but here is the population in the world. Of course, there are peaks here because of China, India, but there's a disaggregation by big countries. This is the distribution of the world's population in relation to the equity curve. And in yellow is the distribution of resources. So there's, there is a disconnect between resources and people, and there's a disconnect between both and the equity curve. I won't go into those details. There are thousands of analyses and graphs on that, but we don't have the time. And what would be the redistribution uh, modalities and towards a symmetrical <coughs> equity curves in theory, or at least biased, uh, skewed uh, equity curves, but accommodating everyone within <coughs> those resources for a feasible life, for a dignified life. I won't go into the relations between Gini and those different redistribution models. In fact, for that equity curve, we wouldn't have resources, enough resources for all. And there's a whole debate on the growth, particularly on the, on the relation with, uh, with uh, let's say, heated economies. And there's a whole area of studies now on the subnational inequalities and inequities, if, as this uh, picture reflects. This is what we've seen in Mexico. And these are the distributions between regions in Mexico. These are states. And these are the 2,400 um, municipalities. And how many of them uh, are under the equity curve, or above, or below, and how that, uh, how that links to something that Anna said territorial cohesion, how important that is on, on regions that have to be in solidarity because they can have excess after accommodating each municipality within the equity curve and those who are, which are in need in countries like Mexico. So that, that's a, that there's a very good analysis of linking all this, let's say, access to uh, life expectancy and well-being and territorial cohesion. Uh, and in fact, this is similar to what we have in the EU as a target, which is 60% of the median as a, as a trigger for territorial cohesion. It ends up being quite similar, but with this, uh, with this evidence. My last slide is this one. A fair society, in my opinion, needs to accommodate it, all citizens between the, between the dignity threshold and the excess threshold. And it's not me, it's Plateau who said that 2,300 years ago. And, and the, other, the other, as I said in my talk, the, the other ethical margins of you want, if you want, of, uh, of, uh, in, of equity is the planetary boundary. How, what is the average of resources and the distribution of them in relation to a planetary boundary? 
And the mobility needs to be, in my opinion, and this is with, with my very limited capacity in comparison to yours, mobility also has to have one very important, dim important dimension, but it's very difficult to measure. How do we reward mobility in relation to the contribution to common good? Uh, mobility could be great, and, and, and using the best of your opportunities for GDP would be, would be great, but if you use that, for instance, to speculate with the economy or to, I don't know, to, to do anything which is not really good and sometimes harmful to society, then probably that should be questioned. So I had different models here, but I won't go into that. But uh, I believe these four elements uh, summarize what I wanted to say, the ethical margins and purpose of social mobility. Uh, I hope that contributed to some of your thoughts and debates now and later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Juan.